Hello, kidney warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach, and this is Dadvice TV Live. Now, for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, who are new here, welcome. It is great to have you here on Dadvice TV. You're going to find our community here is extremely supportive, positive, and helpful because we stick with science-based uh, diet, nutrition, and other information. None of that woohoo, none of those fake cures or any of those scams or anything like that. We get our information directly from professionals in the kidney community. Now, if you are new, let me, let me quickly introduce myself. My name's James, I'm a kidney warrior. I was diagnosed stage five and told that I had no hope of getting better. Well, guess what? My doctors were wrong. I worked with a renal dietitian. I started being more active, exercising, changed the way that I eat. I got rid of all the junk food, the fast food, the sodas, things like that. And I discovered that when you start looking at nutrition, there's a whole world of great foods for you to eat when you happen to have kidney disease that will help you improve your health and your quality of life. Now, tonight, we have with us back from quite, it seems like it's been forever since I've had her on here. I think it's probably been only three weeks or so, but it feels like forever. Please welcome one of the best resources for kidney patients is a renal dietitian. Please welcome from Plant Powered Kidneys, renal dietitian, Jen Hernandez. Hey, Jen. <laughs> hey, James. Hey, everybody. So good to be back and really looking forward to tonight's chat. I'm really excited for the topics that we have tonight because the holidays are so fun and I want them to be fun and enjoyable and safe and healthy for all of you. So for those of you that have never heard of me because I have been a little MIA, my name is Jen Hernandez. I am a renal dietitian. So I am a registered dietitian here in the United States and I'm also board certified in renal nutrition. This comes from my years of experience working with people, not only in dialysis, but in chronic kidney disease, all stages, stage one through transplant. And I love helping people with their renal diet, helping them learn all of the good foods, particularly plants that they get to enjoy in their diet to help them feel good and most importantly, keep their kidneys functioning. That is my absolute favorite thing and we see it all the time. One of the things I love, love hosting is our signature plant powered kidneys course. And this is a six week course. We run it a few times every year and we actually just wrapped up our final run for 2021 a couple weeks ago. One of our students, I was just telling James, had announced in our private community about his kidney function improving from a GFR of nine to 42. It's so incredible. Yeah. And that is just one example of the student success stories that we have from the course. We also have dietitians at Plant Powered Kidneys, and I am working on getting more renal dietitians to work at Plant Powered Kidneys and help more kidney warriors just like you who want to make changes and follow a more plant-based diet. So stay tuned in the upcoming months in early 2022 when we will have more help more ideas more support more resources for you at plantpoweredkidneys.com now a great resource while they're waiting is the plant powered kidneys facebook group tell them a little bit about that yeah, this has been such a wonderful group and it is still astounding me how much it has grown. We have last I checked over 6,500 members in this free but private community. So this is something where you can join and when you post questions and comments, they do require moderator approval. We do that as a safety screening for our group. Uh, but once you get in, anything you post in that group, it's private, meaning it's not going to be on your Facebook feed, meaning other people in your life that you're connected to personally, they don't see everything from the group. So it's nice and private. That way you don't have your kidney questions and your kidney business all over Facebook for your friends and family to be nosing about and, and to be asking a lot of questions. You can join so many other people that are in similar, not the same, because we know 
everybody has a different kidney journey, but in similar places for kidney health. And, you know, we were just talking, James, about how you love the pictures, all the oh, food pictures yes. that come through. <laughs> That is for So the biggest challenge, it's one of the things we're going to talk about tonight, is what to eat. When you first get diagnosed, it seems like you can't eat anything. But actually, there is a giant world of variety and flavor to eat. And my favorite part of the Plant Powered Kidneys Facebook group is going in and seeing the pictures of meals that people make. And they're telling you, here's how I made it. And I substituted this. And here's how it turned out. And it is just Oh my goodness, amazing, all the variety and ideas that you can get right there. Yes, and I do have one more quick announcement just because I probably will forget if I don't, if I wait until later. Uh, we will be doing an Instagram Live. I will be joining two other dietitians on Instagram. So we're at plant.power.kidneys on Instagram and it's only on Instagram. So if you're not on Instagram, you might want to consider joining because sometimes I do go live in there and have great chats with other dietitians, other people in that community. But I'll be talking with two dietitians that both specialize in diabetes because it's actually National Diabetes Awareness Month. So we're going to talk about that connection between diabetes and kidney disease. So if you're interested, make sure you find us on Instagram because we have a lot of good stuff to share there too. Awesome. All right. So let's jump into next week here in the United States is Thanksgiving. And for, I would say 99% of the population, Thanksgiving is a, it's almost like a sport. How much food can I eat before I fall asleep in front of the TV watching football? Yeah. <laughs> but as kidney patients, we've got to be careful and, but we can still enjoy Thanksgiving by making better choices. And that's what you're going to help us with, help us prepare and arm ourselves so we can still enjoy that sport of eating and then taking that nap later in the day. <laughs> and it all starts. Oh, someone said, what is the group name? Um, the group name is Plant Powered Kidneys. And there's also a link to it below in the description. Um, if case anyone can't find it, and you can always email me and I'll send you the direct link to it. But Thanksgiving always starts with turkey. So mm -hmm. how is turkey, even though it's not plant-based, they, they eat plant, you know, corn and stuff, but how, how does that fit in a renal diet? So the challenging thing with turkey is even though it's a white meat, so it's one of the healthier animal proteins that's available, something that really gets me is that I don't know why, but people ignore the potassium in meat. We did a whole other blog article. We talked about potassium in meat and how shocking that is. And turkey is not an exception to the rule. So one of the things to pay attention to if you have a potassium restriction is to understand while yes, there are other foods on our Thanksgiving plate that will have potassium, turkey is not excluded from that consideration. So you really want to pay attention to the amount of turkey if you do enjoy to have that. Um, I do have the full nutrition breakdown of both the turkey breast, just the turkey breast, and then turkey with the skin. Because some people are like, well, I like there we to. Go. Yep, there we go. Yeah. So some people like to have the skin. And if that's something that you enjoy, it's kind of interesting to see the nutrition differences are not that significant when you're going with or without the skin. We have a little bit more calories, about 25 more calories. We see that the biggest difference is probably the total fat, which is essentially doubled because it goes from about one gram of saturated fat to about two grams of saturated fat. Um, there's not really any consideration for sodium there. You know, we know that animal proteins don't have fiber, so there's really no carbs, there's no fiber in there, there's no added sugars, <laughs> that's not where you find it, but it has a lot of protein in there. So if you have late stage CKD, and if you're following a low protein diet, you wanna be really careful with turkey because it's so packed with protein. Again, just like other animal meats, there's a lot of protein in there, so be super careful. Now, a little bit lower, we see the vitamin D, calcium, iron and potassium. Now, turkey is a source of some iron, not a ton, but we don't need that much throughout the day anyway. However, there are other plant options that you could have for iron, and we have a whole other article 
all about iron rich foods too. That actually does include a free download in that article if you haven't checked it out yet, just a little hint. <laughs> um, but finally, we see at the bottom the potassium content. It's over 200 milligrams, which is technically considered to be a high potassium food. So this is where I get a little irked when I've read articles that say, oh, don't worry about potassium with your animal meat. It doesn't matter. Well, wait a minute. If you're going to tell me that 200 milligrams in cherries is something to be careful with, but you're not mm -hmm. going to tell me 200 milligrams in turkey is not something to worry about, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't compute for me. So this is something that you really want to factor in and understand if you're on a potassium restriction, it's not going crazy with turkey. And turkey is one of those things. It's easy to kind of have larger portions and kind of lose mm -hmm. track, especially when you start mixing in the gravy and potatoes and stuffing and all oh, the delicious stuff that comes with a, an average uh, <laughs> Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> yeah. And I remember too, when I worked in dialysis, you know, protein is a really big part of, it's, it's a really important part to the diet when you're on dialysis. But again, when I would hear somebody get encouraged, and I used to do it myself as a dietitian because we didn't know better back then, mm -hmm. but we would encourage more turkey, more turkey, more protein, more protein. What, again, we weren't realizing is that they were getting a lot more potassium and then they'd come back after the holiday and their potassium would be high. We'd say, what did you eat? And you know, the poor fruits and vegetables would get the blame. And we didn't consider that we were encouraging more protein, which meant we were actually encouraging more potassium. So again, I really can't emphasize this enough to understand that it's not about more is better, especially in the case of turkey. Well, it's great that it's so low in sodium. That was surprising mm -hmm. to me. So I'm very glad mm -hmm. to, to hear that. How is it with phosphorus since so many kidney patients also have to keep an eye on phosphorus that their function's really low? So the phosphorus count, as you saw in the nutrition information, it's not typically available, not in our nutrition facts, because it's not something that the public is concerned about or thinking about. Just people with kidney disease is think, are thinking about uh, phosphorus. It has about 215 milligrams, that, that amount is about 215 milligrams of phosphorus. What's really, really important to consider when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the turkey that you have, and I, when I was writing this article and doing the research about it, it astonished me how some turkeys would have the added phosphates. So we've talked about this before. This is something that is injected into the turkey. It's Plumping inorganic. It's it's exactly. It's a preservative, and it is not naturally there. It's not organically there. So it's not organic phosphorus, although the turkey itself already has organic phosphorus, just like we have phosphorus in our bodies. Animals have phosphorus in their bodies as well. So they have both organic and potentially inorganic phosphorus too. And that inorganic, those additives are really what you want to be careful of. And some, I'm not going to, I'm not going to call out specific brands, but I'll say some of the really popular brands did have phosphate additives. So when you're shopping for a turkey, if you haven't already, or if you did check your turkey and see if it has those phosphate additives, because that would be another reason to be super limiting, super careful with your turkey. So it looks like turkey at Thanksgiving is probably okay, but we got to really keep an eye on those portions because that's, i as far as protein goes, boy, that thing is packed with protein um, yeah. and a little higher on the potassium. Um, but it looks like I can enjoy some turkey a little bit. Yeah, for people that are in earlier stages of CKD that don't have the severe pot uh, potassium or protein restrictions, it's going to be a little bit more of a flexible diet because we don't have that severely declined kidney function. So your body and your kidneys are still able to process the nutrients that you're getting in. It's still not an excuse to go overboard. And, you know, we talk about loading up our plate and just including so much food, but our kidneys and our body don't work that way where we can take care. It'll try, it'll do its best, but that's not really what it's meant for because we have food all the time, all over. We have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and that's really the way our bodies have adapted with our current eating environment. So if you want to include turkey, especially earlier stages, definitely okay, unless you have been told otherwise by your own healthcare team. Later stages, 
be super careful with the protein. And then dialysis, it can be enjoyed, but be aware that there is potassium in there. So if you need to limit, that's going to be a consideration. Now, is there is there any part of kidney disease where, hey, if you're in this part, you probably should just skip the turkey and enjoy other foods instead? Well, as I mentioned, the later stages, those are the ones that I'm really protective and really cautious with. Uh, so when I talk with my private clients or with my students, for people that are in the late stages, protein, I'm a little more conservative about. And the research and the evidence is there to prove that a low protein or a very low protein diet is beneficial for stages four and five, sometimes stages three as well. And we do have a whole article about the low protein diet on plantpoweredkidneys.com that you can check out with tons of information that dives more into why and how it's beneficial too. All right. So let's say I decide I'm going to pass on the turkey. Or maybe I'm making the meal here and I got turkey for all the relatives. What are some non-meat based or non-animal based um, turkey alternatives that I may want to consider having instead? So there's actually a lot more. It, it feels like every time I'm looking at the meat alternatives, that section of the grocery store gets bigger and bigger and there is no shortage of alternatives. So there's a few options that we can cover tonight. Uh, some of them are going to be products and some of them are going to be ideas for recipes. So first of all, some of the products, James, I know you are familiar with this brand uh, that you really enjoy, which is oh. corn. Yes. <laughs> and someone had asked, Hey, do they have something? Somebody asked, can we, really eat corn turkey? Yeah, so corn has a meatless roast. And actually, when I was doing the research with these different options that I was finding, this one was probably one of my favorites. And that's because it is a more moderate amount of protein. It's for the roast that you make, a serving size is a quarter of the roast. It's 15 grams of protein, which is a moderate amount. It's at least less than that heavier burden. And we'll talk about some of the other higher ones later too. But this one is a little bit more moderate. It could still be high for people on a low protein diet or a very low protein diet. 15 grams of protein could be half or more of their protein need for the day, depending on your protein limit. So be careful. Um, but the other thing I like is that the sodium was really... I would say acceptable when it comes to something that's pre-made like this. So it's 460 milligrams of sodium. It's not crazy. It sounds high. And I know a lot of people are thinking zero milligrams, zero milligrams, oh. zero milligrams. You're, you're that's drinking not water the trick. then. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's not the trick. The trick is to find your lowest sodium options and choose low sodium or no salt added whenever you can. That way, when you do come across a product that has a little bit more sodium, it's not going to be a huge, it, it's not going to be that last, like I'm, I'm imagining Django when you're pulling out the blocks mm -hmm. and you're just like, you're putting at the top, like, okay, let's hope that this keeps working. That's not, that's not what we're looking at. We're looking at controlling the whole diet, limiting salt wherever we can. So that when we do have something that's a little higher in salt, it's not the end of the world. So this one has 460 milligrams of sodium. It didn't have the information for potassium. And I did reach out and ask them if they would share that. And they said they don't have it. It's not, it's not quite there yet as far as the mandates. The new nutrition labels do ask for potassium, but a lot of companies, they still get time, especially with COVID, they get more time to make those changes to their, their products. So they don't have the potassium yet, but there weren't any additives and there was no phosphate additives, which I really, really liked. So that's probably my favorite. We have several other options. Um, we have a couple. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah from the blog. <laughs> from, of course, from the blog. <laughs> so we have those two tofurkey options. We have the holiday roast and the ham style roast. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the brand tofurkey. They've probably been one of the longest standing brands out there. I remember hearing about them when I was younger and my sister was becoming vegan and she was looking at different options. Um, so I, those I think are potential options, but you see that holiday roast, 33 grams of protein in that serving of the one fifth of the roast and 900 milligrams of potassium. So this is a high potassium Ooh. food. Yes. 
This is high potassium. This is very high protein. So somebody for this amount would probably be early stage, somebody who doesn't have the restrictions or somebody on, let's say, I would say probably peritoneal dialysis. And I say specifically peritoneal dialysis because people on PD need more potassium than people on hemodialysis or HD. So this one, I don't think would be, be appropriate for all dialysis types. But yeah, on this one, I'm, is, not a, I'm not a huge fan of that 670 milligrams of sodium for only right. the, the one serving. Because who eats one serving? And you're going to have other food. So this mm -hmm. one might be one where you got to pick some lower sodium sides if you go with this. Yeah, and I think when we look straight below that at the turkey breast, I wanted to give the turkey breast as a comparison to oh. if you were to choose just turkey. So when we look at the holiday roast compared to the turkey breast, it's higher in protein, it's higher in sodium, it's much higher in potassium. Although, like I mentioned, the turkey, depending on where you get it from, may have additives. Mm. The tofurkey one didn't have the additives. So there is that that benefit too. And that's why I do feel for PD, it could be a potentially good option. Now, the other one we have, I'm going to go down to the tofurkey ham style roast. So you see the serving is the same. It's a fifth of a roast and it's also mm. a little bit closer to the turkey, 22 grams of protein per serving, mm -hmm. 640 milligrams, which I think for a ham type product is actually pretty on the low side because yeah. ham is usually in like the four digits for sodium. So it's actually a lower sodium option. And then that potassium is quite high. So again, this would be something maybe for more so for PD or somebody in early stage that wanted to enjoy something like this that didn't have the protein and potassium restrictions. Now, quick um, question. The, the tofurkey, yeah. they use soy as their basis, correct? Uh, yes. Can we talk, because there's always a lot of confusion around soy and can we help clarify that for people yeah. who might be afraid of soy and they don't need to be yeah i'm glad you brought this up james because we were talking about this from the facebook group somebody had asked about soy and they called you out and they said hey james yeah. said don't eat soy but well, i, I said i don't I eat soy in. so they interpreted right. it as nobody should eat soy Right. And we know that everybody has a different situation going on. So everybody's going to be different. There might be some people to avoid soy. There might be some people to include soy. More often than not, it's an inclusion rather than an exclusion because soy has a lot of great benefits. It is so great. It is a cheap, affordable plant-based protein source, and it doesn't usually have additives. Although Colleen, I don't know if she's watching, but Colleen found one in our um, PPK course community. She posted one in our group to say, hey, this one has additives, be careful, which was really helpful. So everybody's different. Please yep. pay attention to what's good for you and your body and your health. And you can't follow just any one person, not me, not James. We are all on different journeys and we all have different dietary needs. So you want to talk with your healthcare professionals, your healthcare team, your doctor, ideally your dietitian to find out what is best for you. And they will be the ones who can tell you exactly what you can or cannot have. I will tell you from my experience working with my clients, there is many more times over, <laughs> there are many more times that I'm saying, absolutely, please enjoy it. than I'm telling them to pick a different option. Like I would say nine times out of 10, I'm saying, yes, that is absolutely fine. Let's talk about it. Let's look at the nutrition content so you can understand how it fits in and what we're going to be focusing on. So that's going to be the really important part for this. Yeah. And for anyone wondering why I don't enjoy soy, I actually love soy but it doesn't love me. I had a food sensitivity and allergy test done and I cannot eat blue cheese. And I'm also allergic to penicillin. So that one kind of makes sense. And I, can, mm. I should not be eating soy because it causes, it's almost like I'm allergic to it. And though it's very minor, it just causes inflammation. So when I look at products at the store, I personally avoid those that have soy in them, but I use soy at home, just this last weekend, I was watching um, the uh, uh, Bengals game and I was eating some edamame, just having a, a blast with that. 
So I like cooking with soy products or things that are made of soy. And I just know, okay, I'll drink a little extra water. My throat will get a little itchy. You know, it's just dealing with it. Yeah. And that's a great way. That's a great thing to point out that you are aware of it and you're making the choices that you feel are best for you. And that is only your decision. That is a hundred percent up to you and not anybody else. Yep. And someone asked the Gardini, Gar, Gar, Guardian? Gardine. 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 I, that brand looks like they asked, where do you get that? Is that from Target? I think I've seen those. At I've seen, oh yeah. I've seen it at Target. I've seen it at Walmart. I've seen it at um, Safeway and Fry's. And I'm trying to think of other grocery stores that I've gone through. I've seen it at a lot. It's a really common brand. The thing is for a lot of these plant substitutes, it might be tricky to find where they are first because they usually will be like kind of isolated in their own section. I have found the plant substitutes in the produce. They had like a refrigerated section next to the um, cold salad dressings and the prepackaged greens and all that. I found it in the middle of the aisles. They had several refrigerated cases of the plant substitutes. I found it in the back next to the dairy or next to the eggs. You have to kind of wander around and take a look or just ask somebody where they're vegan foods are um that's probably going to be the easiest way for them to or if you say like where's tofu usually not always but usually you'll find it in that area um i believe these options are refrigerated and not frozen i'm almost positive yeah all these are at least the ones i eat from this are refrigerated yeah yeah so um i you know what's funny is at meyer these are next to the ice cream Talk about temptation. Uh, at Kroger, <laughs> these are near the um, the veggies. They yeah, have a separate that's where it is in my section Kroger too. by the vegetables. Yeah, mm-hmm. kind of the the healthy section. Yep. Actually, no. One of so I go to two Krogers because sometimes I just like to change it up. I guess yeah. um, one of them one of them is in the vegetable area, and then the other one is back at the dairy. Woo-hoo, consistency. Don't know why. Don't know why. <laughs> Somebody made that call. And there's another grocery store that I would go to that they have a section called health or diet foods or something. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what? Like this, this doesn't explain anything to anybody. <laughs> it's like the land, it's the area that nobody walks down because it's just like, oh, diet, depressing. Oh, exactly. <laughs> They're the foods they don't want to carry. So they don't want people to buy them. Maybe right. that's it. So those are some good options for our main thing, our turkey. What about my favorite part of Thanksgiving meals, the sides? What are some some ideas for us kidney patients to get some good flavor, enjoy it, but not blow our diet for a day? Yeah, I think the thing I think with a lot of the traditional Thanksgiving foods is they're very nutrient dense. They're very rich and decadent. If you think about you know, mashed potatoes with the butter and the cream in there. And we look at stuffing that has more butter in there. We have sweet potato casserole. We have the creamed spinach. We have green bean casserole. Everything, there's like a layer of cream or butter. I have not eaten dinner yet, Jen. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, see, I I learned. I learned I had dinner beforehand. (laughs) Today I had a late day of work, so I didn't eat before this. Oh. And all those things, oh, the only thing you missed was scalloped potatoes. And then There's boom, another one. And cream corn. There you go. You got my whole Thanksgiving going. <laughs> yep. So <laughs> the thing with a lot of these types of dishes, like I said, they're really heavy and really, really rich. So they actually can pack more potassium. Then we realize, of course, a lot of those potato-based recipes that we talked about, Mm -hmm. those potatoes themselves are going to be higher in potassium. And then anything you're adding cream, butter, or sorry, not butter necessarily, but like milk, you're adding that dairy, that will also add a layer of potassium. And then if you're making, let's say you're making dressing or stuffing from a box or something, remember bread has a lot of salt and it, they may have potassium in there for the flavoring. Potassium chloride is a common uh, addition for flavoring without adding more salt. So that's like what we talk about the salt substitutes to avoid, those are potassium chloride. So they're putting potassium chloride in these food items to give them more flavor without giving them more salt, although they're already 
plenty salted. (laughs) Um, But (laughs) these are the things that you want to pay attention to. So on the blog, I separated them from high potassium dishes and low potassium dishes. And the qualification for that in general is 200 milligrams per serving above or under. So above is high potassium, under is low potassium. And the reason I'm harping on potassium is, again, it's something that so many people have fears and questions and concerns about. And in this case, for the holidays, I think rightfully so. Because if we look at a lot of those side dishes, it is a lot of potassium. And Mm -hmm. even for somebody that doesn't need to necessarily limit potassium, it could be a little terrifying, (laughs) I would say. When you realize, oh, I have some of this and I have some of this and I have some of this. And then it all really adds up super fast. Exactly. It adds up. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I do recommend that you can do is double boiling your potatoes. And this is something that is not only, not only proven because there's a lot of talk about leaching potatoes, soaking them in water. That is not well studied or well proven. There are some some articles that look at it, but that hasn't been replicated so much. The double boiling has been studied and replicated and they see, especially comparing it to just the soaking, they see that there's more potassium removed. So if you're going to have potatoes at your Thanksgiving meal, it might not be a bad idea to double boil your potatoes, especially if you need to be careful with your potassium because double boiling can remove about half, if not more of the potassium from the potatoes which is really, really good news. It turns most of the potatoes, it turns them into closer to low potassium. I think almost all of them, except for, I think one, I think the Yukon, I'll have to bring it up. I think the Yukon were the ones that actually hit below 200 milligrams, but it I is something that you can do. I did not know there was a difference in the amount of potassium between the types of potatoes. Yeah, it's pretty interesting, actually. Um, There is a couple articles that talked about the soaking and they talked about the potassium from raw and then potassium from just a regular boil cooking and then double boil cooking. And they measured the potassium content in each of those ways. And then that's how they showed the percent drop or the percent change in potassium based off of the different, um, the different types of potatoes. There's actually like over 2000 types of potatoes. They're like apples. Um, yeah, right. I only but thought we there were two don't... types of apples, delicious and green. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I mean, we know there's more and that's the same thing for potatoes that there's just so many options out there. And there are a little bit of variances when it comes to the nutrients in the different potatoes. Yep. Now, now I want to jump in real quick at the question that Greg just asked so that I don't lose it. He says he's stage three. Great job, Greg. That's To me, that's like, wow, that's nice and early to be working on this. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, does he really need to worry about Thanksgiving dinner affecting his levels that much? So the thing that you definitely want to check is, okay, very stable potassium. So you want to look at your labs. You want to look at your potassium labs and your potassium lab history to see if you've ever had a problem with potassium. If you have, that would be something really important to note because you have a history of hyperkalemia. You have a history of high potassium, which means you have a potential, um, there's a potential opportunity for it to happen again. Now, it really comes down to the types of potassium because there are potassium additives that you do want to be careful with just like phosphorus. So that's something to be uh, paying attention to and talk with the doctor to see if you need to worry about potassium. My, the, what my gut feeling is telling me that it's not a concern unless your history tells you differently, but most people with stage three do not have potassium restrictions. In fact, potassium is really helpful for muscle contractions, for our blood pressure, yep, for our heart health. It does so much for our bodies and most people don't get enough. So if anything, more potassium can be better. And I'm not saying go crazy willy nilly with it, but I'm just saying it might not be a concern to reduce your potassium. So 
I, I know that was kind of a lot of roundabout ways to answer it, but there's a lot of caveats. There's a lot of things to pay attention to in many cases. So you just want to take those into consideration. If, <laughs> okay, let me be nice about this. If your doctor says, limit your potassium, you need to ask why. If your doctor says to limit anything, you need to ask why. They need to give you the proof and the evidence of what they're saying to be true. The reason I say this is because I have known doctors that will just do this blanket statement to say, don't eat potassium, don't eat greens, don't eat this, don't eat that. And it's kind of like a, it's like a coverage disclaimer for them of like, oh, if you don't eat it, we don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. We don't have to think about it. That's not really true. So I love doctors and nephrologists. I've worked with a lot of great nephrologists that I have the utmost respect for, but I've also known of some that will say things like that and terrify their patients for no reason. So just make sure you ask why and that you understand and you really feel comfortable in the explanation. And furthermore, if they're telling you to limit something, that's a really good opportunity to ask to see a dietitian. And if mm -hmm. they say the diet doesn't matter, because we hear that a lot too. That's wrong. If they say the diet doesn't, then you say, well, then why are you telling me to limit potassium? Exactly. <laughs> right? That doesn't make sense. You're saying diet doesn't matter, but limit potassium, but you don't need to see a dietitian, but you don't need to eat potassium. Wait a minute. Something's not adding up. So make sure you really talk about it. Yes, Alexandria, I'm checking on the comments. Empower yourself and ask questions. Yes. 100% accurate. Be your best yeah. advocate, says Mr. Kidney. Exactly. Yes. So, so I'm maybe, gonna like... maybe if Greg hears some good low potassium side dishes, he might be tempted to dine more on those than not even have to worry about the high potassium foods. Yeah, that could very well be an option too. And there's a lot of great lower potassium options. So, you know, as, as most people know, Thanksgiving is not the time when anybody goes hungry. You will have plenty of food and it's going to be there even after the meal anyway. So don't worry. If you don't get it in round one, the next meal, the next day, you'll get some then. Start with your favorites. Start with a little bit of what you really enjoy. Leave the rest of it aside and move on. Even though we put a lot of hype over the meal, a lot of hype over this food-heavy holiday, we are not going hungry. We are not missing out. You can have a turkey dinner any time of the year. You can have mashed potatoes and stuffing and whatever you want any time of the year. And sometimes that's helpful to think about it in the way of, oh yeah, I can really eat this whenever I want. It's not that I have to gorge on all of it right now because I'm never going to have it again because that's not the case either. Yep. So what are some low potassium side dishes that we can enjoy? So I would say some of my favorite low potassium options would be, I love the cauliflower recipes. I personally am a big cauliflower fan. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if everybody is, but I think those can be really, really helpful. So try using something like some cauliflower, especially if you're doing mashed potatoes, you can throw some cauliflower florets in there, especially even when you're double boiling the mashed potatoes on that second boil, throw some cauliflower in there, cook some right along with the potatoes, and then you mash it all together. And it's super easy. No one's going to be the wiser, especially when there's already potato in there. So you can use something like cauliflower. I also really enjoy radishes. I think oh, radishes yes. are a very underutilized vegetable. We actually just posted about radishes today because I was like, oh, these poor guys, they don't get enough love. So we shared about radishes on social media today and I love roasting radishes. Did you ever do that, James? I know we talked yes, about it. Yes, and my daughter and I, we both will eat radishes straight out of the refrigerator like little mini apples. We just, mm, mm -hmm. watching Netflix, um, Right now, we're going through the middle. We're on the very last season, season nine of the middle. And we love snacking on radishes. I put them in salads. I cook them up in my mm -hmm. stir fry. It gives a crunch, that little spice. Mm -hmm. mm. Yep. It, they're so good and so versatile. And then when you roast them, it totally removes that spice of them. And it makes, just makes them nice and creamy. Mm -hmm. And oh, they're so good. They're so good. I need to make some in my life again. Um, I also really love sauteed green beans. So this is a good option for like, instead of the green bean casserole, that's a lot of cream, those condensed soups that are really high in salt. 
and the dairy that adds more potassium. If you do a nice, bright, fresh sauteed green bean, it looks so good. Get more color on your plate. That can be a really great option. Another area for color is carrots. If you do some glazed Ooh, carrots, yeah. you do like maple glazed or balsamic oh. glazed, always really, really good. So those are some of my favorite options. Uh, turnips, that's another roasted vegetable that you can use. Kind of a another option or another, I'm sorry, alternative for those potato recipes. So you can do turnips, you can do cabbage, you can do a nice cooked cabbage, saute, get it nice and crisp, use a little bit of apple cider vinegar, and it gives that cabbage a nice kind of bright, briny flavor to it. Don't go too heavy. I've done that. You don't want to do that. Um, <laughs> but Brought so us there we go. pictures of some of those delicious things you're talking about. Mm. Yeah. And look at all those colors. I mean, that is just so inviting. Even the, even with the boiled cauliflower, you know, we're using this as kind of a, a replacement for the mashed potatoes. So you will have that, I guess that white representation mm -hmm. on your plate, but we have the green, we have the, the purples and the pinks and the reds and the orange. We have a lot of really nice colors and we know the more colors we put on our plate, the more nutrients we are giving our bodies, which is really fantastic. And I don't want you to finish your Thanksgiving meal feeling uncomfortably full and regretting. That's the big thing. I don't want you regretting what you ate. I want you to feel really proud of how you're nourishing your body, even through something like Thanksgiving that we kind of go a little bit off the, uh, off the path sometimes. Oh, <laughs> uh, these are, you know, it's funny. Mr. Kidney even mentions, he said, balsamic is a great way to bring veggies alive. I've yes. never used that except on like a salad dressing, a balsamic vinaigrette or something. Oh my gosh. you got to use it. So roasted Brussels sprouts, Brussels sprouts are a little bit higher in potassium, but roasting Brussels sprouts. And then after you roast them, you just put them in a bowl, toss it with a little bit of balsamic vinegar. You could even do it before the roasting if you want, because when you cook with the balsamic vinegar, it mm -hmm. caramelizes and it gives a sweetness. Oh. If you do it afterwards, it gives it a nice kind of rich, slight tartness. Oh, it's so good. I'm doing so that good. this I'm weekend. Really I'm glad trying I it. I love yeah. it when I learn something new like this to add more flavor and variety to my food. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I saw you lately. I hope I'm saying that right. As asking about cranberry sauce. I don't mm -hmm. have that on here actually, but cranberry sauce is a good option, especially from fresh or even frozen cranberries. Cranberries are a low potassium fruit. So that can be a really good option. You know what? I'm one of those, I, I don't like cranberry sauce. And I think when I was writing this, it didn't even occur to me <laughs> because I don't like cranberry sauce. I so used sorry, to hate it. Now I love it. I mix it with the turkey and the yeah. stuffing or mashed potatoes. And oh, the little zing it adds. I can't. I've heard of, I've heard of it as a great, it's a great layer flavor for like a sandwich or something. I just can't. I'm sorry. And it came out in my blog that I am I am a self-proclaimed cranberry, I'm not going to say hater, disliker. Not for me. <laughs> but if you like cranberries, they're low potassium. Enjoy. Awesome. And everyone's giving these great suggestions, too, in the comments. Wow. And they're loving oh, these good. pictures. Whoever picked them out, Jen, I don't know if it was you or Shelby. It was me. Oh, great, great selection. <laughs> Yeah, it's we eat with our eyes first, right? And that's another thing too. When you're when you're putting together your plate, or as what I call your plate real estate, because real estate has high value, right? And you only have so much of it on your plate. So when you're looking at your plate real estate, you want to determine what really is worthy. And we eat with our eyes first. So when you're looking across all the Thanksgiving food options that you have, think about what you're really drawn to. Like, oh my gosh, that looks so good. I've got to have some of that. And then if you see something else and you're like, okay, that looks, you know, like a box stuffing mix, like, okay, been there, done that, you know, not going to write home about it. So I'm going to, I'm going to pass on that because it's not really a thing for me. So, you know, look across all your options and choose the things that you really want to savor and enjoy. Make sure you take your time savoring and enjoying them. We all eat really fast, chew very thoroughly, Try to take 20 minutes to eat. It can be really hard. You might want to practice. Yes, and stay hydrated. Make sure you're drinking enough fluids before, during, and after your meal to stay well hydrated. And uh, that's, that's a whole other benefit. This helps slow me too. down. 
I, I yeah. drink while eating. Now, we've Great. talked about the main meal. We talked about the sides. Now, there's still the part of finishing, and Will just asked a question about that. Thanksgiving pie options. Yes, yes. We couldn't we couldn't pass on the pie, right? This is exactly. again a Thanksgiving thing. We're not gonna ignore it. I, I didn't do the cranberry, but I'm not gonna miss the pies. That's just that's blasphemy. So we're gonna talk about potassium in pies. And the most common, the most traditional pie that we think of with Thanksgiving has to be pumpkin pie. Ooh, now yeah. It is something that is going to be a little bit higher in potassium, but it's not as high as you would think. So if you have a standard serving, so a nine inch pie, if you have one eighth of that pie, it's gonna be about 220 milligrams of potassium, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's considered high, but it's not crazy high. And it's something that could absolutely fit in if you know where you stand with your potassium. Now, with a dessert, with a sweet treat, this is not something that we're going to say go crazy with regardless, really not even considering potassium to begin with. We just want to know that this is something that to, we want to enjoy a small piece and then move on. And that's it. So find the pie that you enjoy. And if you do enjoy pumpkin pie, know that it's probably going to be okay. Um, you have spoken with, James, I know you talked with Jessiana from the Kidney RD. Yep. And she does have a lower potassium pumpkin pie recipe on her blog. Ooh. So, and I've recommended that to clients before. So she, you can go check out that great uh, recipe from her website. Uh, we do have our little infographic about the potassium in some different pies. So we included apple pie, cherry pie, sweet potato here. pie. Cause people are already voting. I see pecan oh, pie. Really? I saw apple pie. Oh, cherry pie. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's my dad's. Yep, that's his go-to. Oh my goodness. The only one of these I would skip is the sweet potato pie. Because really, growing up, I owe so many times, so I have two funny stories, and they're both pie related. I would go and, to get pumpkin pie at like the buffet or something, get the biggest, giantest slice I could get, and then take a bite, and it would be sweet potato pie, which is not what I was expecting. So I don't like sweet potato pie. That is that same experience is what got me to temporarily dislike um, sour cream because I once mistaken it for Coo Whip and covered my pumpkin mm. pie in sour cream. That wasn't Yikes. good. <laughs> no. But I remember there is a sour cream and raisin pie. My grandpa really liked that. I remember he would get sour cream and raisin pie. I've and never heard of that. Sour cream and it, raisin. He was from Montana. I, I, maybe it's a Midwestern thing. I don't know if somebody watching can help us because it's been years since I've seen or had it. This is when I was like a little kid, but this is what I would uh, see. So, um, but we do see here that there are plenty of options and half of them are under the 200 milligram potassium count, including pecan pie. So this is something that you can fit in even with the potassium restriction. But again, it's, it's, it's an allowance. You have a potassium allowance. How are you choosing to spend it? If you want to use it all on more high potassium foods at your Thanksgiving meal, understand that you might want to pass on the pie. And that's okay if that's what you want to do. It's always up to you. It's always your decision on what you want to do for your health and your nutritional needs. Oh, those looked delicious. So we covered the the main stuff. Is there any so we're we're we got about eight minutes left before the top of the hour? Um, oh, are there any other tips for Thanksgiving? And then we can dive in to try to grab some of the questions. Yeah, I do have just one more quick thing. So we talked about those plant-based substitutes that are coming from like packaged um, plant replacements for turkey. But don't forget that you can use vegetables to be a replacement. One of the things one of my dear clients has absolutely loved or come to love, she didn't think she loved them until we talked to it and she tried it is mushrooms. And Ooh. there are a lot of great, great recipes to use mushrooms in holiday recipes. Excuse me. When we were looking at some options, um, I remember we came across a portobello mushroom um, wellington, like a beef wellington, but they used mushrooms in it. 
and it looked so fantastic and very holiday special kind of style mushrooms are a little bit higher in potassium they're a little they're just above that 200 milligram mark so it's something to be aware of but you could always cut it down with replacing some of the mushrooms with cauliflower or carrots or other vegetables another great option that has become i would almost say trendy are stuffed squash if you haven't seen them I, I mean, I just this morning watching the news, I saw like this morning or yesterday, I saw somebody on there doing a cooking demo about stuffed squash, acorn squash specifically, and how they fill it with like wild rice and maybe some pine nuts and some other vegetables. And it's like in its own little dish, kind of like a, a mini pot pie or something, but you're using the squash. So it's kind of like uh, my mom used to make uh, the bell peppers, cut out the bell peppers yes. and stuff them with things. Exactly, exactly. So there are some squash that are lower in potassium. So like spaghetti squash is a lower potassium option. And then there's some that are higher, like butternut squash is higher. So again, depending on where you're at, you want to make the choice that's good for you. But honestly, I think those are some of the best choices. If you want to do one of the purchased roasts from the store, we you have the information. We shared the different options. Uh, but trying something that you make from vegetables can be really enjoying and satisfying and just make such a great memory and maybe shift the trajectory of health for your family by giving more vegetables on this day of Thanksgiving where we're here to be really thankful for everything we have. And that's something that I'm always a big fan of is, you know, showing these new types of traditions to our family to say, hey, even though we have been eating certain things for all forever and ever, let's incorporate a new tradition and let's start this and maybe just pairing it with it, having it as an offering. Not everybody has to have it and that's okay. But if it's something that you'd like to have and you'd like to start as your own new Thanksgiving tradition, that can be really, really special. Cool. All right. We got so many questions. <laughs> I'm going to try to grab some of them. So Olivia asked, is pork meat considered red meat like ham? Yeah, it is. Pork is considered to be a red meat. And I know, I remember their marketing, didn't their marketing used to be like the other white meat or something yeah, like exactly. that? Yeah, no, it's actually red meat. It is considered to be in the red meat category. So it is something to be really careful, really cautious with. Um, and to limit or possibly avoid because red meat is not something that I typically recommend. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm sh I'm shocked. Now, Carrie asked, and I didn't think about this, what about having a glass of wine at Thanksgiving? Well, as we've talked about before with alcohol, it can fit into many people's diets. The number one thing that I always want to advise people to be aware of is your medications because alcohol can interact or interfere with medications. So make sure you get the clearance from your doctors first. And I say doctors plural because if you have medication prescribed by your primary, but you also have medication prescribed by your cardiologist or your endocrinologist or your nephrologist, you want to talk with the doctors that are prescribing you medications to make sure there's no harmful interactions. And it can always be much more enjoyable if you get that green light, knowing that your doctor has said it's okay for you to enjoy a glass of wine. Uh, typically, wine is a better option because it's not going to be as high in phosphorus like beer would be. Um, and liquor is not typically recommended, especially because people tend to get a little bit more carried away since it has a very small serving size. <laughs> Now, Will has a great question. Any recommended substitutes for eggnog? Mm, you know what? I actually just got my first carton of nog. I, I broke early. I broke really early. I, I see it at the um, store when I'm at the store. It's tempting. Yeah, <laughs> it is. What I love looking for are the plant-based substitutes. And that is just usually what they're doing is they're using coconut milk or almond milk or cashew milk. The one I got is oat milk based. It's I'm not really crazy about it. And I didn't read the label. I didn't do what I preach. I didn't read the label and I saw that it has phosphate additives. So I'm not recommending it. Um, it's, it's this new one from Trader Joe's that I'm disappointed in. But there are some really good plant-based 
eggnog substitutes. And I will see about getting some specifics pulled out to share with you guys on Facebook and Instagram in the upcoming weeks. Awesome. Yeah, I love eggnog. That's my dad's favorite drink besides coffee. Yeah. Pure black <laughs> coffee. Not a drop of anything in it. If he could remove the water from coffee, he probably would. <laughs> 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 Let's see. I'm looking through the question. Someone had asked, Carrie had asked, um, and I'll answer this. Are there any side effects to Renadil the first few weeks that you take it? So Renadil is a probiotic. And your renal dietitian may recommend it. I take it. I've been taking it over, I think, almost three years now. Um, when you first start taking it, it can cause a little bit of gas. And as your body gets used to it, that will work itself away. Um, you take two pills. You can take one in the morning, one in the evening, or two capsules just in the morning. Um, I like taking it with food. I've gotten used to it. My body's perfectly fine with it. Will also ask, Will, you are on a roll today. I love this. What about Cornish hen? Ooh, um, I need to look that up. I haven't had, you know, I used to actually make that Cornish That sounds hen. like a good Thanksgiving alternative. It's a, I, I don't eat Cornish hens because they look too small. <laughs> That's the thing though, is like, if you're having it in its entirety, because I remember like my my mom would make it for us and we would each get a full Cornish hen. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. That's a lot for one meal. So um, let me see. I, I've got to look up some of the nutrition information because I wish I could tell you guys I have all the stuff memorized, but my brain would have exploded years ago if I hey, tried. That's the power of the internet going on yeah. to real good databases not to Facebook or to just random websites and getting the nutritional information. Yeah. And you can bet I'm not asking Dr. Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what I'm seeing, uh, so Tyson, which is a really popular chicken brand, they don't show any phosphorus additives. That's one of the first things I look hey. at protein for, it says serving size 112. And I'm like 112, what? Like 112 hens, 112 grams. 112 milligrams. I don't really know. It just says 112. So I don't know what serving size they're talking about. Um, but whatever it is, there's 19 grams of protein in it. Um, a hundred, you know, ugh, the, so the cholesterol, I'm not really worried about four grams of saturated fat, which as you saw the Turkey, even with skin was under two grams. So that's pretty high in fat with that Cornish hen, which I guess makes sense. Cause there's more of the skin mm -hmm. that's on it. Um, let me look at some other ones. Okay. If we're going to do the meat only, here we go. Three ounces of Cornish hen. So we can compare it to like the turkey breast that we yep. saw earlier. Um, 20 grams of protein. So that's pretty close. It was 26 for turkey. Um, 127 milligrams of phosphorus, added phosphorus, or sorry, natural phosphorus, organic. Um, 212 milligrams of potassium. So pretty much like equal. Yeah. And 54 grams of milligrams of sodium. Um, so it's still it's, no sodium say, almost. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty low, um, negligible if anything. So that's three ounces, 85 grams, one whole bird. So if you were to eat a whole Cornish hen, that would be 52 grams of protein. Um, okay. That's getting that's up lot. there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, 550 milligrams of potassium, also high, 328 milligrams of phosphorus, 139 milligrams of sodium. So if you did that whole corn, still good that on would the sodium, pretty... just not the yeah. rest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. So I, I would be really careful. I would really be careful if you did a Cornish hen, make sure you're not putting that whole thing on your plate. Make sure you're taking a, a piece of it and that you're enjoying mostly your vegetables and maybe some fruit pie for your dessert so that you're getting a lot of nutrients there. There we go. All right. It is the top of the hour and those are all great suggestions and tips to help those of us with kidney issues enjoy our Thanksgiving. Don't overindulge. Keep it on your portions, everybody. And as you saw, you can go ahead and enjoy a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Make a few substitutions so you save room for a little piece of pie, maybe a little dab of Ku Whip on it, not sour cream. 
Mmm, enjoy your Thanksgiving. And you don't have to eat it all at once. Stretch, exactly. Make it Thanksgiving weekend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take your time to enjoy it. The food's not going anywhere. And you can always, if it does go anywhere, you can always get more of it. You know, people love sharing their recipes. So if somebody brought something that you really enjoyed, ask for the recipe and you can make it yourself whenever you want. It doesn't have to just be on Thanksgiving. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jen. And for everyone else, I'll be back in two nights on Thursday with Dr. Rosansky. And then next week, Thanksgiving week, I am off working around the house. I'm going to try to clean the garage before it gets too cold and it starts snowing here in Ohio. So I'll see everybody back here in two nights. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Bye.